maybe they're going to tell you about this, but we're going to flow from Pat right into Don, who I've never met, but he first fished in Alaska in 1969, the year I was born. At the age of 15, captain of a boat at 17, fished salmon and halibut for 20 years. He and Pat fished together in Cook Inlet, and despite that, have remained friends. <laughs> He lives in Snohomish, Washington with his more than patient partner, Kim, and they're going to tag team this next 30 minutes. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, well, Don is one of my very best friends, and I uh, was, I just recently had a piece uh, of fiction published by the Tishman Re Review. And uh, it's a it's a piece called the sinking, mm -hmm. and it's about it's it, it's about a boat. <laughs> and um, as a piece, it reads it reads around 24 minutes. And so I was I was thinking I would I would read from it just because it's got published this month. And um, so I wanted to read it tonight, but I I couldn't do it in 15 minutes. And so I was, I called Don up and I said, Well, what I'm thinking about doing is doing the beginning and this kind of the setup, and then. Um, and, and then just getting to a good stopping point and saying, if you want to see the, hear the end, go to the TishmanReview.com. And I said, is that a shitty thing to do to an audience? <laughs> and he didn't answer, but I knew the answer you know, that it was. And instead, what he said, being my friend, how about I finish it? So we concocted this plan. So that's what's going to happen. I'll read it to one point, and then he'll come up and take it over from there. So. All right, thanks, Don. So, one of the reasons, one of the things that inspired me, one of the things that inspired me to write this particular piece, which is not a piece that you hear, not the kind of piece you hear very often at Fisher Poets, was because of that very thing, is that we don't talk about stuff like this. And all too often, it isn't fiction, but this is. The sinking. The water reflected a calm, pale blue around the boat, sitting low at anchor in the first light of dawn. In the distance, a dark, darker stripe of cobalt, almost black, broke the smoothness where a breeze flowed off the mountainside on the far end of the bay. Seagulls floated past with the outgoing tide. On the vessel, there was no movement. All aboard were asleep. As the planet rolled from night to face the sun, the men, bay, and boat rode together inside a space like that between two giant breaths of things that had happened and what was to come. The boat, a 58-foot saner rigged for long lining, with a reel full of gear and a plywood baithouse aft, sat low in the water with a hold packed full of halibut and ice. The skipper and his four-man crew had been catching fish for the past five days without a break. Tired and with the weather forecasted fair, the skipper and crew found the bay an inviting anchorage to catch a few hours sleep before making the run home. They pulled in and dropped anchor, silhouetted against a dusky sky, streaked with high cirrus clouds. The activity on board died down quickly, the last movement on deck when the skinny deckhand rock walked barefoot to the stern, brushing his teeth with one hand and holding a coffee mug of water in the other. He held the toothbrush in his teeth and looked at the faint burn of pink on the horizon while he pulled the front of his sweatpants down with a thumb and took a leak over the side. Finished, he pulled up his pants and watched a fish jump in the distance. He took a moment longer before washing out his mouth and leaning over the transom to spit into the sea. He turned, shaking his toothbrush as he walked back into the cabin and closed the door. Hours passed. The crew slept. In the bowels of the engine room, a hose leaking under the clamp that held it to a fitting that pulled seawater in from beneath the waterline and overlooked and, and since the boat took to sea two weeks earlier 
finally ruptured. The ocean poured freely into the bilge under the engine. A boat floats because it displaces more water than the vessel itself weighs. Once the weight of the vessel exceeds the displacement, it sinks. To prevent seawater from filling the saner in the event of a leak, a pump with an automatic float switch was installed at the bottom of the bilge below the engine. The pump worked to empty the water from the boat, but was hard pressed to keep up with the incoming seawater. But keep up it did, and would have done so until the engineer discovered the problem in the morning and turned off the valve that fed the damaged hose. But the spray from the hose soaked a small rag hanging over a wire beside the engine. Once the rag absorbed the water, it slid off its perch and landed in the bilge. Wadded in the rag, a long strip of discarded electrical tape floated free. The pump was mounted to the hull inside a cracked debris guard that protected the impeller from potential obstructions. Loose in the mount, one side of the pump lifted above the guard as the impeller spun, moving 2,200 gallons of salt water an hour through the hull and into the sea. The electrical tape, caught in the current created by the pump, slipped past the debris guard and was pulled into the impeller, which promptly jammed. The pump made a gurgling sound as the water remaining in the hose drained back into the bilge. Unchecked, the water began to rise under the engine. Forward in the forecastle, the top bunks were reserved for greenhorns. To port slept the skinny skipper's nephew on his first fishing trip. His expression in his sleep was the same as it had been for the past week. The opened-mouthed look of someone who can't believe what he's seen. Even with his eyes closed, his face looked surprised, like he was watching whales surface next to the boat, or reacting to the news that the crew was expected to work until the fish quit coming over the side or the hold got full. Sleep is what fishermen do in winter, the mate told him in, earlier in the voyage. The kid wasn't the type to ask questions, and he commented, commented even less on his shipmates' discussions and arguments. At 17, he only knew how little he knew. He slept the deep sleep of one who was overtired and overwhelmed, on his back, arms framing his head as if he had fallen there. Aside from his deep breathing, he hadn't moved since he hit the bunk. Below decks, the pump spun briefly against the tape, but only succeeded in pulling it further into the impeller, straining until the wire powering it began to overheat, causing the circuit breaker in the wheelhouse to trip with an audible click. Click. Dreaming, the skipper dropped his plastic net mending needle onto the deck. He was asleep on his day bunk in the wheelhouse, his feet a yard away from the breaker panel. The ship's controls glowed red in the dim light of early morning. Shaking his head at his clumsiness, he bent down in his dream and picked up the needle. A stocky 51-year-old, the skipper was normally a light sleeper when at sea, but five days of steady fish, a full fish hold, a calm bay and a good anchorage, a reliable boat underneath him, the anchor alarm set, and a forecast for fair weather gave him permission to dive into the deeper sleep usually reserved for his bed at home. A good rest would charge his batteries for the run back and the hours they would spend delivering the catch. He used the needle and its mending twine to repair a hole in his dream that never got smaller. In the engine room, the deepening pool of seawater was about to engage the boat's last line of defense. Another float switch located above the bilge pump, but below the critical starter motor on the engine and the batteries to either side, waited just above the now rapidly rising water. Once the water lifted the float, an alarm would go off with a piercing shriek in the wheelhouse, warning the crew of the threat. Swirling, the water continued its climb. 
The starboard top bunk held another green crew member, a friend of the skipper. He signed on, looking for a summer adventure from his middle school teaching job. Exhausted and sore, he lay on his back snoring. He spent the last five days tired. Tired of being seasick, tired of being chilly and wet, tired of diesel, fumes, and dead, heavy fish. His hands were swollen and his fingers and wrists stung from dozens of scratches of halibut teeth. His back ached, even though he'd begun eating ibuprofen like candy. As he pulled off his boots and climbed into his bunk, he never appreciated his bed at home and his mundane life with his, life with his wife and children more. His sleep was the deep, dreamless sleep of escape. The engineer snored beneath him on the lower port bunk. A lifelong fisherman, his beefy hands lay huge on his chest like two fish from the hold, white, motionless slabs. His boots stuck out from under the rumpled sleeping bag piled over his legs. Pieces of halibut covered his tangled red hair and beard and festooned his pillow, sleeping bag, and boots like feathers. His hands twitched in his sleep as they turned to wrench that became a live red snapper on a raft in the open sea. He rolled over in his bunk as he felt the wave lift a raft and fought to keep the fish from sliding off. Salt was thick in his nostrils. Over a year ago, a different green deckhand smoked what was left of a joint as he came down the ladder into the engine room. The skipper was in town and left him to do a job to, and left him a job to install the new high water alarms float switch. It was one of a dozen menial tasks he'd been left with while the skipper was running errands, and he was bored and more than a little stoned. While he listened to Cheryl Crow sing in his headphones about how she can't cry anymore, he lost his grip on the stainless mounting screws under the engine. Instead of retrieving them, he plucked a single rusty screw off a shelf and used it to fasten the switch to the hull. The power drill battery was low, and he only got the screw halfway in before it gave out. He pulled at the switch, and it held. That'll do, he thought. And as he went up the ladder, he sang with Cheryl about, his about her lousy luck. In the salty dampness of the engine room, the rusty screw continued to corrode and weaken. Across from the engineer, the mate looked the picture of contentment. Even a week's hard work hadn't hurt his looks. He was a handsome man in his 30s who emanated confidence. As the, as the deck boss, he had good reason to feel self-assured. He had seen the crew through a long haul of constant fish. The best catch of his career was in the hold, and the crew was safe and healthy. His lips had a slight, slight smile to them as his eyes moved and beneath the lids. He was in a Mexican cantina beautiful, dark-haired woman in his arms. They were dancing to a song he knew but couldn't name. Their feet were bare as they glided across the thick, cool grass of the floor. He caressed her long hair and neck with his hands as they spun. They stared at one another as they moved, her eyes deep brown. He stretched his desire upward on the bunk as they leaned together in his dream. Her lips parted. He may as well have been in a feather bed he was so far removed from the ocean and the boat where he slept. As the water level reached the ruptured hose, the constant splashing that could have signaled a lightly sleeping crew was silenced. The force of the incoming flow created a current that swept over and lifted the high water alarm switch, pulling against the rusty screw until it snapped in two. Without a screw to hold it in place, the switch hung in the current, tethered by the wire power, powering it, and suspended upside down by its own buoyancy. Unable to activate in that position, it was useless. When the vessel dropped anchor in the bay with 43,000 pounds of halibut and ice already in the hold, her rounded hull settled nicely as the weight lowered her center of gravity. But hours later, the three feet of water in the engine room weighing 64 pounds per cubic foot, added another 